Welcome to the Einstein Forum. And even more, welcome to one of my two favorite eternally recurring events at the Einstein Forum, namely, uh, namely, sorry, <coughs> named the presentation of the work of our current fellow. As some of you perhaps know, but I'll tell you in case you don't, because some of you look like you might be eligible for an Einstein Fellowship at some point. Um, we give once a year a fellowship uh, to one young person defined as roughly under 35. <clears throat> uh, somebody who's already presented excellent work in something or other, and who proposes a project that's significantly different from what he or she has done before. Uh, we are thereby, uh, um, <clears throat> we have the, as far as I know, the most unique fellowship uh, in the world because most people, as you, some of you will probably know, pay you to do more and more of what you've already been doing. And our idea with the Einstein Fellowship was to support particularly young people who are under pressure uh, to get jobs and to do more and more of what they've been doing until they're about 50 and then hopefully they're stable enough to do something else. But uh, at that point, often it's the case that nobody has any more energy to do anything but more and more of what they've already been doing. <laughs> Uh, so if you're interested, we'll advertise the fellowship again um, towards the end of the year. Uh, you'll find all the details. You get to live in Einstein's, well, next to Einstein's house for half a year. Um, it's the gardener's house next to Einstein's house. Um, but uh, it's still, you get the aura. You, you know, late at night, I think sometimes, uh, I hope Ryan, you and Lisa found, you, you noticed the, the spirit, you noticed the ghost wandering. And uh, we actually came up with the idea many years ago in our board because, as one of our board members put it, it was the only thing she could think of to do with the house that would make Einstein's ghost happy. Um, my second favorite eternally recurring event, of course, is our conference at the end of the year when our board meets. One of the things that they do is choose next year's Einstein Fellow, but one of the things they do is have a really terrific conference. And uh, we've taken the most unbelievably diverse subjects from heroism to solidarity, to victims, to the book of Job. Uh, and I used to always be nervous before the conference because it was often really very crazy subjects and one never knew, but I can now assure you whatever subject we take, it will be great. It will be worth your two and a half days. June 25th to June 27th, we will be talking this time about a text or a small set of texts by one of my favorite writers and philosophers, Jean Amari, and we'll be talking about Jean Amari as an enlightenment figure, not merely uh, an Auschwitz survivor. So, enough about that. This is who. Uh, this is where you are at the moment um, uh, in the Einstein Forum's uh, time, and <clears throat> I fortunately don't have to introduce Ryan in any detail because for that we have Amanda. Um, please join us uh, in welcoming her and in welcoming Ryan. Uh, it's my total pleasure to introduce Ryan Ruby tonight. I'm going to keep it kind of short because we have a very rich program for you and you are going to experience the breadth and depth of this very ambitious project that Ryan has undertaken in the past six months. Um, Ryan's fiction and criticism have appeared in The Baffler, Conjunctions, Lapham's Quarterly, N Plus One, and the Paris Review Daily, uh, and elsewhere, and he's translated two novellas from the French for Redux Books. 
He was an instructor at the Berlin Writers Workshop and has been an affiliated fellow at the Institute for Cultural Inquiry, the ICI. Uh, his debut novel, The Zero and the One, was published by 12 books in the US in 2017 and in the UK by Legend Press in 2018. He lives in Berlin. Well, I just want to say thank you, first of all, to you, Amanda. Um, I should add, for those of you who don't know, uh, Redux Books was founded by Amanda herself and had a wonderful run of printing works and translation. And Amanda was one of the very first people I came to know here in Berlin, and she was my translation mentor uh, and introduced me to uh, some of you out here in the audience. So I'm very grateful that we're going to be able to be duoing uh, tonight, as well as, uh, I should add, uh, Amanda, besides being a translator, is also a novelist and has just completed her first book. So that is very exciting, and we will be very much looking forward to it. I'd also like to thank you, Susan, and the rest of the board, and uh, Gore, and Martin, and Antonia, and everyone else who helped make our stay in Kaputz. Uh, very wonderful, I say that on behalf of not just myself, but also uh, my partner Lisa and my son Anton, who really enjoyed being out uh, for his first time in what I call nature, but some of you may, <laughs> may disagree with that classification. And finally, of course, I want to thank all of you who came to visit me there. Uh, in Kaput this summer, and to all of you who made the trip down to Potsdam uh, today. I know it's a little wide out for the Berlin crowd uh, to come out to Potsdam, especially on a Thursday night, so I really appreciate uh, your being here for what I am um, going to warn you now. Uh, Amanda's rich was a euphemism for quite long, so I uh, <laughs> appreciate your patience. We'll try to keep this as uh, entertaining as humanly possible. Uh, and, but before we do that, I just want to give you a brief overview of the, of the night's events. Uh, first, there will be an opening statement um, by, by me, and that will provide the uh, broader theoretical context for the work that I was doing this summer. And then there will be cross-examination by counsel uh, for the majority, uh, and that will last approximately uh, 15 minutes. And then there will be a, a deposition of the work that I have done at this year's Einstein, for, as this year's Einstein Fellow, and that'll be the sort of main work uh, that I was doing there. And there will be a second cross-examination by the Council for the Minority. Uh, Council for Majority and Council for Minority in this particular hearing are the same person, Amanda. Um, but if you like topical humor, that's, uh, that's as far as I can go. Um, <laughs> and, then, no, and then we will open up, hopefully, for your questions. Uh, and each of you, to, ir irrespective of your party affiliation, will be able to ask uh, questions as long as you like. And then, of course, the best part of the evening, we will break for wine. All right. So without further ado, I would like to begin with uh, the theoretical methodological statement of the evening. And I just want to say that this, this project began, or the sort of seeds of this project began in, already back in 2011 with an article I wrote about Occupy Wall Street um, when I was in New York. And I don't know if uh, you, how many of you have a recollection of Occupy Wall Street? What is the, anyone? I know it's a long, quite a long time ago, oh. seven years, not eight years even. Um, what does everyone remember? If they remember one thing, there are, I suppose, two things. But what does everyone really remember about Occupy as a movement? The distinctive feature, I thought, was, anyone? Yeah? No? no leadership. There's no leadership. And also, how is the communication structure? It was this thing called the people's mic. So yeah, exactly. So Misha is moving his hands, right? And for me, it was what really struck me about that, uh, being an observer um, and visiting Zuccotti Park, was that here was a uh, um, a movement, a social movement, that was organized um, at first by Adbusters, a Canadian magazine, and then on Twitter and Facebook. And then you arrive in Zuccotti Park and you are working with uh, the mic check, the people's mic, right? 
and that was amplified by hand gestures. So we have the real clash or coming together of very advanced media technologies with very almost the, so hands and vocal cords, the most basic human means of communication. And as I wrote that article, I was thinking a lot about the Toronto Sc School of Communications. Uh, and so that's point one. Now in the second, in the subsequent eight years, um, like many of you, I have been uh, witnessing what is going on with populist movements on the left, but mostly on the right, and the coverage of those particular movements, and the relationship between that coverage and, um, and new social media and media technology. And that coverage talks about, on the one hand, things like um, hyperpolarization, um, partisanship, um, po you know, sort of the, the rhetoric of populism, right? And on the other hand, uh, media filter bubbles, um, disinformation, fake news, echo chambers, and so on and so forth, right? So we have these two ideas, and these ideas are very frequently connected. But it seemed to me that they were missing uh, a middle term. And that middle term is the subject or the self. And so what I'll be talking about tonight is how these three terms um, are ultimately connected. Uh, new media technology on the one hand, populist polarization on the other, and the kind of subject that this new media has created and why that particular subject is ripe for uh, the populism that we are seeing in the United States and Europe and around the world today. So the structure of my argument will be based on a chain of articulation familiar to media ecologists and media theorists. And it goes like this. Developments in media technology create communications cultures. Communications cultures strongly influence conceptions of subjectivity and intersubjectivity, and conceptions of subjectivity and intersubjectivity in turn play a very large role in determining the ontological, procedural, juridical, and normative structures of the state and non-state institutions that we classify as political. And when these reach a certain level of saturation in society, the use of media technologies can radically alter the very institutions that structure that society. Now, historical periodization is more of a heuristic tool than an exact science. And while historians of communication are divided on the details and designations, uh, an uncontroversial periodization of communications cultures would look something like this. Oral culture, post-oral or scribal culture, literate manuscript culture, high literate print culture, post-literate electronic culture, and digital culture. Each of these communications cultures is distinguished by the series of tools for storage and transmission of information that is around the media technologies that are available to it. Interface with these technologies has significant effects on the consciousness and unconscious of its users, on their memories, sensorial hierarchy, temporal perception, affective structure, personality, conception of self and other, as well as a broad range of cognitive capacities. New technologies generate new institutions and modify existing ones. They enable new forms of knowledge and management and privilege those who successfully adapt to the requirements of the new communications culture. In short, it creates new elites. Among such persons, those belonging to what Harold Innes called knowledge monopolies, a noticeably different mentality develops, which is often incompatible with the mentality of those who belong to other communications cultures. And it is for reasons like this that broad uh, shifts in communications cultures are historically followed by massive social upheaval. Uh, to take the classic example, interface with writing, especially in its typographic form, that is print form, has profound effects on its users. And internalizing the skill sets of literacy uh, creates a certain type of being. Uh, whereas cultures without writing are forced to rely on AIDS memoir of oral poetic narrative in order to store a great deal of information in the collective mind of its members, a literate culture com uh, can commit such information to the page. And the simple ability to refer to information recorded in physical texts not only increases the amount of information that can be stored, it expands the kind of information that can be known and changes the being who has access to it. 
So, the auditory bias of oral culture submerges its members in the collective language and history of the tribe. Writing reorients its users visually, creating an experience of distance between self, language, society, and the world. Uh, thanks to the externality and materiality of written signs, language acquires the status of an object, which makes comparisons between new statements, all statements, and the world, hence objectivity possible. Freed from the tethers of specific narrative situations and scenes, writing enables literate persons to think conceptually. It becomes possible to conceive of abstract objects like mathematical truths and moral principles that are taken to be valid universally and eternally. Psychic resources previously devoted to the conservation of knowledge can now be spent on the progress of knowledge. On the transmission side, communication in oral cultures requires the simultaneous physical presence of communicants, which is exactly what is occurring now. The personal nature and speed of conversation promotes discourse that is emotionally volatile, whether it is encomiastic or more often antagonistic. But writing puts distance between communicants, both spatially and temporally. Produced and consumed in private at a much slower place, writing encourages detached reflectiveness. As a result, the further removed one is from oral culture, the less truth is measured in terms of the social status or rhetorical prowess of speakers, and the more it is measured in terms of the objective validity of statements. And I can't highlight that enough. No longer tasked with upholding collective memory or limited by face-to-face -face communications, literate persons acquired the latitude to think independently of what Weber calls traditional authority and individuality as we understand it today becomes possible for the first time. The sense of distance from the collective life, life world is ramified when literate persons inevitably turn their newfound privacy and analytical ability on themselves and begin to engage in introspection. So writing divides such persons from the world and from society, but also from themselves. In the above description, we can begin to recognize many of the features, individualistic, analytical, detached, innovative, objective, temporally multidimensional, and internally divided of the being that I will call the liberal democratic subject, somewhat anachronistically. Over the course of its development, the liberal democratic subject, which from here on out, LDS, evolved an epistemic anthropological as well as a socio-political dimension. Uh, from the point of view of intellectual history, it owes its origins to Plato, and it is given a metaphysical foundation as the empirico-transcendental double in treatises by Descartes and Kant, and a quasi-legal status as man and citizen in documents by Jefferson and Lafayette. The LDS conceives of itself as an individuated duality. It is a collection of unique individual particularities that is also in possession of a universally shared abstract personhood. The former is the private man, bound by the specific nexus of personal characteristics, such as affects, beliefs, talents, interests, and identities. The latter is the public citizen, autonomous, disinterested, agnostic about the good, and formally equal to all other citizens. Just as the field of knowledge was supposed to be the domain of the transcendental rather than the empirical part of the subject, the liberal democratic public sphere was supposed to belong to the citizen, not the man. Deliberation, whether among amateur citizens in the public sphere or professional citizens who represented them in government was possible, not just because strict procedures regulated the validity of forms of argument, but because the different deliberating men recognized each other as being equally citizens. It was this common identity that enabled all participants to leave their personal interests at home, as it were, and to make collective decisions that would be universally valid and advantageous to all, or at least to as many as possible, irrespective of their personal characteristics. It was also to this autonomous universal citizen that legal protections, privileges, and responsibilities accrued, even if historically it was individual men who suffered their loss, violation, or absence. And uh, from now, you'll see why I've been using uh, scare quotes for men. So, like the double-bodied king of the political theology that preceded it, the dualistic subjectivity of liberal democracy was a persona ficta. 
In the 20th century, it was repeatedly unmasked as such by philosophers, historians, literary theorists, and social scientists. Heidegger, for example, argued that the subject had been given an outside epistemic role in the lived experience of Dasein, his name for culturally bound human being. Building on his work, Foucault argued that at first, this empirical transcendental double was in fact a function of linguistic, biological, and economic discourses. Innumerable Marxist, feminist, and critical race theorists have argued that citizen and man could not be distinguished in the way liberal democratic political theology posited. In its origins, the abstract citizens, they claim, was a concrete identity. In fact, a bourgeois white male whose pretensions to disinterestedness, naturalness, and universality served to mask a program of exclusion and domination. Whatever their other differences, these theorists argued that it was impossible for the LDS to translate its merely empirical features and that the dualist model of subjectivity should be replaced by a monist model in which these empirical features were taken to be imminent to its identity. However, unmasking a fiction as such does not in and of itself negate its effects. Every persona ficta is what uh, we might call a virtuality, uh, the illusio or a real abstraction which developed and internalized over the course of centuries by means of powerful social institutions and disciplinary mechanisms does not disappear when its premises are made explicit. Thus, while the above critiques accurately describe the historical construction of the LDS and provide a metaphysically coherent model of the subject with which to replace it, they remain both incomplete and merely symptomatic. Just important, uh, I would like to argue, if not more important to the development of the LDS were contemporary media technologies like the printing press and paper, institutions like the book market, library and postal system, figures like the author and the genius, and products like the novel, the pamphlet, and the diary. Likewise, the characteristic features of liberal democratic politics, representative government, deliberative decision-making, a firm distinction between public and private spheres, the rule of law, and independent press and rights, are all reflections of the high literate communications culture that gave birth to it. On top of this, critique must not only account for the construction of its object, but also for itself. So if it is to be argued that the LDS was created under pro particular political, cultural, economic, ideological, and technological conditions, the same must hold true for the critique of the LDS as well. The modest subject of the late 20th century critique is no less, I argue, a persona ficta than the LDS it hopes to supplant. What then makes it possible? It is no coincidence that these particular critiques were lodged at the very same time that literate culture was trans transitioning into a post-literate culture, and with it, the dualistic subject of print was giving way to the monist subject of electronic and later digital media. Around the same time, media theorists like Marshall McLuhan, Walter J. Ong, and Friedrich Kittler were noting how electronic and technological media were reintroducing aspects of oral culture not seen in the West since the consolidation of the Gutenberg galaxy. The storage functions of writing had already begun to be transferred to technological media like records and film. The introduction of telephones, radio, and television increased both the speed and range of information trans transmission. Writing had made it possible to communicate with those who are not physically present at the cost of a time gap. Electronic media were shutting the gap. They broke print culture's visual monopoly and re-externalized forms of experience that writing had internalized. Although its members still displayed high levels of literate residue, Ong went so far as to characterize post-literate culture as a kind of secondary orality in which many of the psychodynamics of orality were suddenly back in play. As a result, in McLuhan's Global Village, detached individual subjects of literate cultures were rapidly being retribalized. These technological changes are not only partially responsible for changes in our notions and experiences of subjectivity and identity, they are, no, they are in no small part what makes the above critiques of the subject possible in the first place. So, what was true of analog electronic media technologies is true a fortiori for the digital media technologies that constitute the present communications culture. Despite appearances, media are becoming less diverse in the digital era. As network, as network computers integrate the space and imperialize the functions of all other media formats, 
the screen is becoming the sole interface for video, audio, and textual content. What is rising is a totalized media monoculture whose strongest resemblance is to the totalized media monoculture of primary orality. Thanks to high levels of internet usage around the world, the worldwide connectivity and co-presence of which McLuhan could only dream has now become a reality. Uh, instantaneous information transfer is now bi-directional as social networking platforms, crowdsourcing sites, and comments threads collapse the distinction between information pr producers and consumers that once held for print, radio, and television, and along with it, the hierarchies that regulated the quality of that information. As a result, online communication approaches the spatiotemporal conditions of conversation and text-based communication takes on a distinctively oral flavor. Because of the temporal brevity of SMS and the spatial brevity encoded into the character limit of the tweet, we have begun to see the return of kinds of typographical condensation and abbreviation uh, that stresses the sound of words at the expense of their canonical visual forms with text, chats, and tweets, not to mention ideograms like emoticons, bitmojis, and emojis, information is compressed enough to be taken in all at once, which provides a temporal experience closer to listening than it does to that of linear reading. When we use such tools, we are not so much writing as speaking to each other in text. The nature and tone of our communication changes accordingly. The spatiotemporal limitations of these formats make it almost impossible to engage in the sort of abstractions and logical scaffolding characteristic of writing. They are replaced, as they were in the oral poetic tradition, by repetitions, aggregates, and formulae. Whereas the delayed pace of writing fostered detachment and a sense of objectivity, instantaneous digital communication is as emotionally volatile and agonistic as oral communication can be. Nor is it all surprising that social networks in which externalized sets of personal characteristics interact with each other, with other such sets, uh, regulate themselves like shame cultures rather than literate guilt cultures, which require members to be capable of comparing inner, internal states to sets of abstract ideals. Life online, um, as I'm sure you know, is much like village life, where privacy is in principle impossible, thanks in part to people's willingness to overshare, but also, and more importantly, thanks to rigorous state surveillance. So while oral and digital cultures exist at opposite poles of information storage capacity, the externalization of knowledge and memory to the internet has created a hive mind whose closest equivalent is to the collective consciousness of oral culture. The sheer quantity of information exchanged on the internet means that while everything is stored, almost nothing is remembered. For all practical purposes, electronic text has become as evanescent as speech. In a further irony, information overload has leveled temporal experience. The presentism of the digital era bears a great resemblance to the oral immersion in the past than it does to the multi-temporal texture of high literacy. The digital present isn't so much eternal as it is fungible, recreating itself in ever diminishing units of time. And whether time moves too slowly or too quickly, the expectation that nothing will change is this, has the same effect as the expectation that nothing is permanent. Both encourage the kind of situational thinking that is inimical to introspection and historical contextualization. The combined result of these and other developments has been the rapid disintegration of the liberal democratic subjectivity fostered by the technologies and institutions of print. This subjectivity, it will be recalled, is not just a series of cognitive capacities, but also a self-conception as a duality, a common identity. It remains to be seen whether liberal democracy as a political system can survive without it. The early indications are not good. Dualist subjects, shorn of their transcendental half by digital media technologies, have indeed begun to regard themselves as beings whose external characteristics are imminent to their identity, as their critics foresaw. Without this transcendental function, the pluralist, multicultural, multi-confessional, politically diverse societies which evolved under the umbrella of high literacy balkanized into a series of rival identity groupings. This is precisely what McLuhan meant by his observation that electronic media were retribalizing formerly literate societies. 
unlike the LDS, the monist subject identifies with its specific nexus of personal characteristics and orients him or herself towards those who share these. Lacking the ability to think in abstract rather than concrete terms and lacking belief in the universal and eternal applicability of abstract principles, the monist subject is incapable of the kind of disinterestedness and detachment necessary to contribute to discussions affecting people with other identity nexuses. The presumptions of interestedness makes agreement about premises and the procedures by which facts are established impossible. The believability of statements is indexed to the perceived authority of the speaker rather than to the verifiability of the statement itself, just like in oral societies. The agonistic tone of digital communication erodes goodwill and the concept of a reasonable disagreement disappears into a storm cloud of mutual suspicion. Compromise, which acknowledges the validity of other interests and points of view, becomes difficult. Under these conditions, deliberation and discussion, the bedrock of liberal democratic truth procedures and decision making <coughs> break down. And it is precisely this context in which phenomena like hyperpartisanship, polarization, media echo chambers, the spread of fake news and conspiracy theories, and ultimately the rise of post-truth societies and the broader liberal democratic legitimation crisis should be understood. These phenomena have occurred because the subjective and intersubjective conditions that once prevented their emergence have broke down. They are not so much new developments as return of archaic phenomena uh, occasioned by the unexpected similarity between ancient oral and new digital communications cultures. And with that, I want to thank you for having taken your medicine and we will proceed to the first round of questions. is a kind of parenthesis between pre-literate and post-literate culture, and so there's a kind of circularity that, uh, of, of the history that you're arguing. Um, do you really think that, and then, then there's a particular kind of subject that develops in this parenthesis, uh, which is quite a long parenthesis. Can something that existed for so long and leaves such fundamental traces really erode that quickly? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, a great, that's a great question. So I suppose we should begin by distinguishing uh, the claim that I'm not making and that I hope, uh, that I hope I've not been understood to make is that uh, we are now living in the equivalent of, let's say, um, pre-literate Homeric Greece. Our society is very different uh, from that in innumerable uh, ways. Um, and that I think is, and of course, uh, we're in a period in which having come through a series of different communications cultures, uh, that each of those leaves a residue on the subject that we have and are becoming today. And so what I think when Ong wanted to talk about secondary orality, uh, he was very much sure that that was very different from primary orality uh, and that the culture that we are now living in today um, is fundamentally different, but bears important uh, characteristics uh, that are similar to these uh, sort of or the sort of oral state of mind or the oral mentality or the oral way of being that we should be highlighting to see where we are going as subjects. Mm -hmm. Would it be fair to say that the literate subject is embedded in the post-literate subject? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that? That, that, is, that is definitely true, right? And so, for example, even at uh, to bring back just a, a quickly to Occupy, so it wasn't just, of course, that there was Twitter and Facebook and mic checks and the hand signs. It was they had a newspaper, they had a, a radio program, they had camera phones, and so there's a very sort of wide range of different media technologies that were available. Um, but I think that what we're living through is, is a transitional moment uh, in which we are going to see more and more of previously existing uh, media technologies sort of bundled in or sort of monopolized or imperialized by uh, digital interfaces and screen interfaces. Uh, and that actually is very dissimilar from the kind of multi-media uh, 
situation that we had even as early as uh, 60, 70, 80 years ago. And it's actually much more similar to the sort of monocultural aspect of a culture which has one kind of communications media. Um, your depiction of the populist subject lies at the heart of why this argument is relevant for us right now. And the, the words that you use, post-truth reality, which sends a shiver up my spine. Um, we often, when we hear the words post-truth, we think of uh, external situations in society involving journalism. Why is it so fruitful to turn uh, the spotlight on the subject? Mm. So I think that, uh, uh, obviously, this is one thing that is on very many people's minds right now. And... Uh, <laughs> For me, one of the baffling things about the, the present era, and Susan and I were, were just discussing it, right, is that it's not just that we live in a world in which people believe false things, is that we live in a world in which people do not believe true things, um, in which, uh, and people deny the evidence of their senses, uh, deny what they have heard, deny what they have seen, deny what they have read. And the question is, um, how does this become possible, right? Um, and what kind of person, right, what kind of structure, deep philosophical, metaphysical structure, to personhood must exist for the, there to be the old tr truth procedures that were developed under literacy to no longer have any effect on your reception of the truth. And it seems to me that a very important factor in creating that kind of being who will deny, uh, who will not believe the truth that is pre present, presented to them is one for whom the very notion of disinterested truth has no moral or let's call it normative force. Right? So uh, you're having a disagreement with someone, someone says, but it's true, and at a, at a point, what is supposed to happen is someone's like, well, yeah, oh, yes, you're right. I acknowledge that even though I disagreed with that previously, this thing has been pointed out, I've been shown evidence, I've been given reasoning uh, that suggests that, in fact, like, I will concede the point. Um, and that becomes impossible, I'm arguing, because the notion of disinterestedness uh, and the notion of objectivity, which is to say anything that it might be exists beyond any possible subject, is no longer a feature of the way we conceive of ourselves as people. And I suppose it's um, what I hear is a matter of uh, actually empathy, that what, what we're thinking about is a subjectivity that's simply very different than maybe one that we might share. It's a matter of trying to think our way into unthink things that for us are unthinkable. Right, precisely. And, and, and the, so, Going back to the, so the 18th century, there was the flowering of this notion of, of sentiment, right? And uh, the, there was a very high level of concern to attempt to first to imagine what it might be like to be someone else. Um, and of course, that imagination is imperfect. It, the exercise is always flawed. But it was presented as a sort of ethical imperative. Uh, and then secondly, in, a, in the realm of science, of course, there was also presented as an imperative to look at something from the perspective of no one at all, right? So the, the view from nowhere. And if you were to espouse the view from nowhere in polite conversation, you would be laughed at. Uh, it's deeply unfashionable. And I actually think that it's becoming structurally unthinkable. And I'm not saying that we can, any individual can ever take the view from nowhere, but that the imaginative exercise is a necessary normative disciplining for people uh, and that disciplining is furthermore conditioned by the kind of thing that we do when, um, when we read a novel, for example. It's an ideal. It's an ideal, uh, a regulative ideal. Uh, but that, that the, 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 subject, the, the structure of the subject is changing in such a way that that regulative ideal not only has no normative force, but has no literal like metaphysical purchase. One objection that could be made to your argument and which has been made to similar theories by McLuhan and others is that it um, totalizes or at least drastically overstates the role that media plays in subject formation. Uh, yeah. do, you, do you think that has yeah. validity? I've heard that one before, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> it, actually, I do think that objection has, uh, has validity. Um, and I think that uh, when one is doing social science, uh, explanatory humility is always a, a good thing. So uh, we, shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't go too far in making causal connections. Um, but I want to say sort of two things about, about that, about sort of techno-determinism as a claim. Um, one is that, of course, and this is also to be conceded, is that technology does not exist in, uh, in a vacuum by any means, right? So uh, technology does not exist without an economy. It does not exist without a political structure. It does not exist uh, without a, uh, a, any other kind of culture. It is deeply tied historically to uh, military apparatuses and applications. So for example, like uh, in the next section, we're gonna do a PowerPoint. Uh, PowerPoint presentations is a kind of communications media uh, that is extremely popular among the US uh, defense apparatus uh, and who has done numerous uh, work on developing it as a, their means of communication. The internet, uh, does anyone know how the internet was developed? The, the, the problem that the internet was created to solve was how can you communicate between, let's say, Los Angeles and Miami if Washington has been destroyed with a nuclear weapon? That, that's the problem, right? Um, and so, again, uh, and the idea was you create a decentralized network. How can you have a non-hierarchical decentralized network of information transfer that becomes uh, the signature project of something called ARPA and then DARPA? But the point is, is that, of course, none of these things can be taken out of these particular contexts. But what's important is, is not so much an explanation, but a way of looking. So when I'm talking about what media is doing to the subject and what the subject in turn is doing to politics, what I would like to do is sort of abstract all these features out and really focus on the ways in which it is the case uh, that we are having a significant cultural and structural change to who we are as, as beings. Uh, and that's the story that I would like to tell. Uh, and, you know, qualifications can be added to that story uh, with, with rigor and social science. But it's important if we want to hone in on something that we perform the thought experiment of, like, what would it be like if this were the sole determinant? TV radio culture in terms of a return to an oral type mindset as it was posited by McLuhan. Um, but surely there are decisive differences, um, for example, in the number of forums for accessing information and the ability to access it asynchronously, <coughs> asynchronically, so things from many years ago, for example, or perhaps most importantly in anonymity, which is a huge foundational um, factor in internet life. Um, is there really such a continuity? Yeah, another good question. Um, I want to say that that remains to be seen. Um, but actually, we can go back and talk all the way about the beginning of technical media, radio, film, and television at the end of the 19th century to see whether or not this is a continuity. The other thing I, the project might be critiqued for is sort of teleology. Um, but I think that what we're witnessing is it's like like the television, like, like uh, punches the subject in the face, right? And knocks, and knocks some teeth loose. And the internet causes them to fall out, is, is how I would put it. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, we're looking at all, all the way you've described this is very much the case. Uh, we're looking at a, at a radical intensification of the kind of uh, interactions we have with media, with digital culture. So we're looking at uh, an increase, and most importantly, in speed, of the information transfer and volume of the information transfer, all the things that you listed, and I would also add to that uh, bi-directionality, like we can talk back, right? So with the television, you get one, you know, like I was watching PBS yesterday, um, and one of the things that PBS does is you can call, you can call the PBS hotline, um, and you know, and then in the break, right, the, the anchor will take your, um, your, take your questions and hear your comments. And that, that's a remarkably um, basic uh, and very old-fashioned way of interacting with this media, whereas, of course, 
we're all laughing because, of course, in internet life, right, when we interact with people via social media, bi-directional transfer of information. I can talk to you, you can talk to me, we can talk to third-party persons, we can present information to people, millions of people that we don't know, uh, and that is uh, another difference which I think represents a in radical intensification of the sorts of dynamics that we've seen in television, radio, uh, film. Okay. Well, I think we should hear a little of uh, your, your project. The project. Okay. Very good. All right. Um, so, yes, I, uh, the first part was the medicine, and uh, hopefully this will be a lot more fun. It has visual images. I was told that that makes things less boring. Uh, and so, uh, I, uh, so I tried that out. Uh, and what you're about to see, or hear, or both simultaneously, is uh, the product that I've been working on. It's five vignettes. So it's a story of various episodes uh, from media culture and media history. And I suppose credit to uh, Lisa for helping me make this PowerPoint. I've, never made a PowerPoint before. This is my first time. I'm old fashioned like that. Uh, and so I deserve no credit for this, but Lisa also says that it's an incredibly basic PowerPoint. <laughs> so, um, hey, look at that, it works. On Wednesday, December 4th, 1935, beneath an article about the removal of a controversial monument from the front lawn of the county courthouse the 21st page of the Los Angeles Times carried an item about the death of an assistant professor, 32 years of age, a graduate of the universities of California and Paris, then employed at the classics department at Harvard in a hotel suite overlooking downtown's MacArthur Park, where he and his wife, Marion, nay Tannhauser, were staying during a visit to her gravely ill mother, whose estate they were putting in order. The tragic climax to their cross-country trip from Cambridge occurred when the revolver he had been keeping in his suitcase accidentally discharged, mortally wounding him, an occurrence so improbable from a forensic ballistics point of view that a reader might be forgiven for suspecting that this pistol mishap, as the headline put it, was merely the Times Style Guide's official euphemism for suicide not that the paper was in any way squeamish about reporting on the same page the gruesome details of the death of Mrs. Betsy Tribbett of 3530 Chadwick Avenue, who went into the bathroom, grabbed a pistol, and shot herself in the head, all because her mind was inflamed by drink and her husband declined to allow her to take their car out for a drive. Not that anything in the known details of the dead man's personal and professional life warranted coming to this conclusion either. Besides his wife and mother-in-law, he was survived, the obituarist tells us, by a daughter, also Marion, and a son, Adam, who would go on, the obituarist was not in a position to mention, to be the editor of his father's unpublished work, and a celebrated classicist in his own right, until a June day, 35 years later, when the motorcycle carrying him and his wife, Anne, crashed in Colmar, France, suggesting that there was a, ooh, Colmar, France. <laughs> suggesting that there was a curse on the house of Perry just as implacable as the one on the house of Atreus. Otherwise, the assistant professor was survived by what has become known as the oral formulaic hypothesis, his answer to the Homeric question, the problem which, to which he had devoted the better part of his short career, the equivalent in classics to Fermat's last theorem in mathematics, a problem that had preoccupied such minds as Cicero, Josephus, Rousseau, Vico, Byron, Goethe, Schliemann, among others, and which asks quite simply, who is Homer? A historical personage or a fiction, a single poet, or the collective creation of the genius of Hellas. Since Friedrich August Wolff's Prolegomena ad Homerum, published in 1795, it had been generally accepted that Homer, if he existed at all, had not been, as nearly everyone since Herodotus had believed, a writer, having operated in, in a time between the loss of Linear B, after the collapse of Knossos, Mycenae, 
Mycenae and Pylos in the late 12th century BC, and the introduction of the alphabet to Greece from Phoenicia four centuries later, but was instead an illiterate and probably itinerant bard, a singer of tales, to quote the title of the book by the assistant professor's assistant, Albert B. Lord, about their work together, which would go a long way to explain, according to the assistant professor's doctoral thesis, an essay sur un problème du style homérique, the poet's use of epithets like the one about the rosy-fingered dawn and the one about the wine-dark sea, and by extension, the formulaic scenes of images of counsel and battle and supplicating by grasping by the knees, not to mention the use of heroic hexameter itself. If the poet was a singer rather than a writer, and if he was composing not in the quiet context of his study, but in the real-time context of a musical performance, whether before the king at a stately palace or before a crowd of drunks at a lowly tavern, he would need precisely these building blocks, or better still, this needle and this thread, passed down over centuries and remembered only as the lyrics of song can be remembered to stitch together his story. Next to the obituary, the Times ran his academic photograph, in which he bears a strong resemblance, to put it anachronistically, to the RAF officer, played by Peter Sellers in Dr. Strangelove, but if they had taken a photo of him earlier that year wearing native Turkish costume, in which he bears a strong and entirely intentional resemblance to T.E. Lawrence, the assistant professor's personal hero, the newspaper with its love of sensationalism surely would have printed it instead. In these two photographs, we have two images of two kinds of classicists, the old and the new, the philologist locked away in the university library with his texts and the anthropologist who goes out into the field hoping to find there some living remnant of the time before the texts, some small group of people still in touch with an unbroken ancient tradition in order to get some insight into the way the texts studied by the philologist were ultimately produced. To prove an argument about epithets, that is why he brought Marion, Marion, Adam, and Albert, along with a recording device, which you can see in the left, built specifically for him by the Sound Specialties Company of Waterbury, Connecticut, hundreds of 12-inch aluminum discs, the battery of his 1934 Ford V8, and perhaps a pistol to a stone house in Dubrovnik in what was then Yugoslavia, where he had yet to learn the local language and dialects, where the milk had to be boiled before it could be drunk, where bandits roamed the hinterlands, and where, in coffee houses of villages like Gelapoye, on the border of Montenegro and Serbia, were men like Abdo Medevich, an illiterate farmer in his mid-60s, who had never heard of Homer, perhaps, but could play a rich drone on the single horse hair string of his bell-bottom guzla, and could, over the course of a few days and many cups of dark Turkish coffee and a little prompting, sing a tale some 13,000 lines long of all the adventures leading to the wedding of a young hero named Smalek Meho, to prove an argument about epithets. And so it might have remained, a local disciplinary affair, an explosion to be sure, but a controlled one, limited for that matter to one of the narrower halls of the academy, had it not been for the day in 1960 that someone, perhaps Harry Levin, then employed at the Department of English Literature at Harvard, put a gallery put a galley of the Singer of Tales by Albert B. Lord into a manila envelope and mailed it to the address of the office of the person whose essay on myth and mass media had recently appeared alongside his own contribution to the aptly titled Journal of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Marshall McLuhan, Sullivan House, 96 St. Joseph Street, Toronto, Ontario, M5S, 2C4, Canada. As his mother, who transmitted to him the gift of song, he had accomplished what no other mortal had or could, the journey to the underworld, the undoing of death. But as his father, who had transmitted to him the all too human vices of curiosity and doubt, he had failed. Not yet capable of prophecy, he nonetheless knew that one day there would be a reckoning a punishment for this failure, beyond the punishment of failure itself, his loss forever of his beloved to the house of the shades, 
beyond even his remorse, which survived her like a widower's black armband. For if to receive a gift from the Olympian gods is to be forever in their debt, how much more indebted must one be if one squanders that gift, and how much angrier the creditor at the perceived ingratitude, how much more parched the tongue that speaks of exacting fluent revenge. Perhaps that is why, when it came time for his initiation, he did not go to Eleusis to learn the mysteries of Demeter and her daughter, whom he had last seen upon a black throne, moments before his error, his literally fatal error. But back to Thrace, to the town of his all too human birth, where he would become an initiate and then the priest of the mysteries of the new god Zagreus, the first Dionysus, who would teach him how to best suffer the punishment that he already understood was to be his deserved fate. To understand one's fate, however, is not to evade it, it is to move closer to it. His punishment was to come at the hands of his fellow initiates. The nature of the dispute between him and the Maenads is unclear. Ovid believes that it was his rejection of their advances, preferring after the death of his wife, the exclusive company of young boys, that provoked the band of frenzied women into attacking him, hurling pine cone tipped spears and jagged stones at him as he sat by himself in a pasture, hunched over his lyre, playing for his own ears and those of the soft grasses and purple haberlea flowers. He resisted at first, out of unextinguished mortal habit, singing the deadly missiles out of the sky, the plucked strings charming gravity's rainbow in half. But a singular beauty is never a match for mass monstrosity. The voice that had outsirened the sirens was no match for their shrieking. The lyre that had quieted the hounds of hell was no match for the strident pipes and tambourines whose volume amplified with their rage until his melodies could no longer be heard. The laws of nature awoke again as if from an inconclusive dream and the blows began to land, drawing the poet's blood. In an ecstasy known only to those whose bodies become the means through which time catches up with itself, the women lay hold of the plowshares left behind by the farmers who had fled the pasture in terror and separated him limb from limb, scattering them just like their mutual god. The callous soles of the old man's feet registered the change in temperature as, propping on his crooked staff, he stepped from the rugged road onto the cool, polished stone. Faltering, the heart inside him pondered again the justice of the old Theban proverb, which holds that a man begins his life walking on four feet and ends it walking on three, a tripod of bone and olive wood rather than of gleaming bronze, as was the one the priestess mounted years ago and inspired by vapors pleasing to the god, foretold that what was visible would be made invisible and what was invisible would be made visible. A prophecy that had in part come to pass when falling ill on Colophon, he was reft of his eyes. Its complete fulfillment he awaited with each visitation from the young goddess Dawn, now that he could feel the never rusting iron shears spread about his allotted thread. At his side, his daughter held him fast, nor did she let fall the hollow lyre from the tuck of her white arm, but spoke aloud to him, Father, we have come to the high-roofed house of Amphidamas, ruler of Chalkis, lover of the muses. In accordance with the technique they had established during their many wanderings together over the grain-giving land and the salt sea, she described the grounds to him so that he might see their image in his mind and spirit and later sing, if memory willed it, of how outside the courtyard was a great orchard with a fence driven all around it, with pomegranate trees and apple trees, with pears and sweet figs, and of the flourishing groves of olive and the vineyards on the sloping hill below, fed by two springs where the townspeople come to fill their jars of clay with life-giving water. He was able to form some impression of the size of the space from the way his staff echoed on the stones of the portico, 
but more revealing was the way his daughter stopped still once they had stepped lightly over the threshold to admire the divine house, and she spoke amazed of the precious metals that gleamed in the inner room, shining as the sun shines or the moon, of the lintels and pillars of silver, and the cobalt frieze encircling the brazen walls, and of the gold and silver statues of hounds that keep eternal watch over the towering doorway, likening it in splendor even to the palace of the king of Thresprotia, lord of men. And on the roof was painted a black ship, its long oars tossing up the sea spray, its white sails battered in a supernatural storm by the north wind, and on its prow a singer in a shining robe, his head thrown back, his lyre thrust out, calming the creaming waves with a voice such as gods have. There were the leaders of the sons of the Abantes hold their sessions. They were met by a herald who escorted them into the presence of the sacred king, seated in his silver-studded chair, wearing a stately tunic and over it a wooden mantle stained with Phoenician purple. About him were his heralds and henchmen, the queen and his wife and her maidservants, sitting in the golden thrones backed against the walls on both sides or upon footstools before the fireplace spinning the dark colored wool on distaffs of gold, and one the singer's daughter had no name for, sitting near the chair of state upon a rug of fleece, his legs crossed in the fashion of the Egyptians, performing an activity she had never before seen, carving with a short black tip dart on the tablet of many folds he balanced between his knees each time his lord and master spoke. All this she told her father, then, Amphidamas addressed his guests in winged words. Strangers, who are you? From where do you come? Is it on some business, or are you recklessly roving as pirates do? For though you are dressed in vile rags, tattered and blackened with foul smoke, and dangling from your shoulder by a twist of rope is an ugly wallet full of holes, yet you do not appear to be two of our Chalkian beggars, also carrying with you a crooked staff of olive wood and a beautifully wrought lyre. The strangers held the two objects aloft, and the old man spoke in turn and answered him, I am Melisegenes of Aeolian Chime, the son of no father but the river after whom I am named originally a smith by trade. The muse loves me greatly and has given me both good and evil. At Colophon, where I was engaged in my handicraft, I fell ill. I screamed and I dropped in the dust as one gashed by the tusk of a great boar, such as those that roam the foothills of Parnassus, home to the nine daughters of Zeus. And the spirit fluttered from me until an inspired healer sang incantations over me, staying the course of my malady. And the will of the god was accomplished, for the illness reft me of my eyes, but she gave me the sweet singing art. Now I wander over the grain-giving land and the salt sea with my dear daughter, who has forsaken the comforts of the marriage bed to be the eyes of her long-suffering father, singer to the gods and human people. And as clear proof of all that I say, look upon my staff, given to me by the great-hearted ruler of Thresprotia, shepherd of the people, and upon my beautifully wrought ire, a gift from the prince of the warlike Thracians, of the house of Ogorus, father of Orpheus, himself the father of song, cherishing and respecting the one in whom the god inspires song ways of every kind. At Corsaira, I met a citizen of Dokos who speaks of you before all mankind, calling you a lover of the muses, forever delighting, like all your people, in the lyre and singing. Thereby the gray-eyed one put it into our minds to come here, sailing the salt sea far from Thresprotia. If you honor her and us with your hospitality, I will sing to you and all who gather to banquet in these great halls of the love of Ares and Aphrodite, or the labors of Hercules, or the sea-going ship Argos that is in all men's minds, of its frightful voyage from Aetes in possession of a stolen fleece and a stolen daughter, so you will believe that you had been there yourself or heard it from one who was. For these are the men who over the endless earth are invited, the prophet, the healer of sickness, the skilled workman, and the one who gives delight by singing. The prayer that passed through the gates of Amphidamus' teeth went unheard by all save by the god to whom it was addressed, promising a sacrifice of the best heifer in his stables to Hermes Erunios for guiding the slow steps of this blind old man into his presence and into the presence of the pen of his grammateus. But the daughter of Melisegenes, like Argus Panoptes, saw the king look at the man sitting cross-legged next to the throne, and he in turn at the king 
And though she did not know what these looks could portend, she communicated all this to her father, whispering their Aeolian dialect into the hollows of his ancient ear. Calling the words of the old man well-spoken, Amphidamas heartily approved the singer's request for honor, and the queen commanded her handmaidens to bathe their guests, bringing water for them, poured from a splendid gold pitcher, held above a silver basin, and when they were done, anointing the singer sleekly with limpid oil from the olive groves, then throwing about him a cloak of thick fleece and a fine tunic to replace the tattered rags he was wearing. Two of the king's heralds brought out silver-studded chairs for them, while a third hung the clear lyre on a peg placed over his head and showed him how to reach up with his hands and take it down, and a fourth sat beside them, a polished table on which were placed unlimited meats carved from the loin of pig and edged with fat, a basket filled with bread, and beside him a cup to drink from whenever his spirit desired it. They put forth their hands to the good things that lay ready before them. But when they had put away their desire for eating and drinking, great-hearted Amphidamas spoke to the famous singer, saying, If, resourceful Melisogenes, you have had your fill of unlimited meats and sweet wine, then sing to me of the man of many ways, who has driven far journeys after he had sacked Priam's citadel. Tell me of the cities he saw, those whose minds he learned of, and the pains he suffered in his spirit on the wide sea, struggling for his own life and the homecoming of his companions. So spoke Amphidamus, and the old man was amazed at the king's desire to hear a tale of Troy, rather than the tales of the birth of the gods, the war between them and the ferocious titans, or even the adventures of seafaring Jason, which to his mind had greater dignity, being older and therefore more worthy of reverence. But as the blind singer pondered within the division of his heart whether to speak of this in all fearlessness to the king into whose high-roofed house he had been invited, his daughter, who knew the contents of his spirit, spoke words put into her mind by the gray-eyed goddess, she who holds the aegis, whispering again into the hollow of his ear, Dear father, there is nothing wrong in singing the sad return of the Danaeans. People surely always give more applause to that song, which is the latest to circulate among listeners. Nodding his white head at his daughter's wise words, to which it seemed more profitable to him to yield, the blind singer then addressed Amphidamas. I will sing to you of the wise and much devising Odysseus, best of all mortal men, for counsel and stories, if that is your wish. But where, O great king, preeminent among all people, are the banqueters and the revelers and the dancers and the acrobats revolving among them two by two? For into the hollows of my ears no trace of them comes, and my dear daughter has told me that only your heralds and henchmen and the handmaidens and other servants of your majestic wife are now present to hear my song. But it is well known that there is no occasion accomplished that is more pleasant for singing than when festivity holds sway among the population. This seems to my mind the best of occasions. So spoke the singer, and now in turn the king, reasoning like a new kind of man, more like a Phoenician or an Egyptian than any Hellene, Melisogenes or his daughter had ever met, made answer. It is true what you say, godlike Melisogenes, but consider that when you speak before the shepherd of the people, it is the same as when you are singing before the whole flock. For as I am contained in them, they are contained in me. Nor are you singing before me in my court alone. Sitting beside my throne, as your far-saying daughter can surely tell you, is Panos, a grammateus, originally a merchant by trade, who is brought back with him from his many journeys along with tripods of gleaming bronze and fine two-handed goblets and soft rugs of fleece, many rolls of double-folding bublos from Phoenician Tyre, and the magical art of transforming our Ionian speech into the signs he paints on them, through which he cages winged words for all eternity, my own, as I, dispense, as I dispense justice here in plentiful Chalkis, and those of the singers who come to my many-room mansion to win glory for the muse. And if you are, as you claim, and as the tools of your office show you to be, beloved of the goddess who make their homes on Parnassus, you will not say, when the Grammateus asks you to repeat parts of your tale, that he may capture it faithfully in signs as lesser singers have said before him, it is hateful to me to tell a story again when it has been well told, nor, if you were a man of honor, will you refuse my hospitality thus. For a thought was put into my mind when you first crossed the threshold to my palace that the will of a god was also at work here with us this day. 
the gods have spun the destruction of whole peoples for the sake of the singing of men hereafter. But who then will sing of the glory of singers after their allotted threads are cut? A song captures the actions of men, but what art captures the song which disappears like the vital breath of a hero when his skin is pierced by the sharp bronze and it leaves his body for its baleful journey to the house of Hades? The muse has reft you of your eyes and given you the magical gift of singing, for to charm the hearts of men with song does not require the power of sight. But with his skill, my Grammateus will make your song visible to the eyes of men, all men, those who are not now present, to hear your sweet singing, those as far away in space as the one-eyed men of Hyperborea, land of the north wind where Apollo goes every winter, flying thence in the form of a raven, and those far away in time as my great-grandsons and all the other noble Chalkians yet to be born. And in these words, the king, in these words of the king, the old man heard those of the priestess, delivered to him many years before, and understood in his heart their truth. What was invisible would be made visible, and this would be his final song. Taking the clear-sounding lyre down from its peg, where the herald of Amphidemus had hung it, he strummed a rich drone and invoked the aid of the muse in telling the tale of wise and much devising Odysseus, and how he learned from Aeetes' other daughter, the enchantress Circe, how to escape the sweet song of the sirens, though unlike Jason, he had no Orpheus amongst his doomed crew, and how he had also sailed through the doorways of death to receive the wisdom of the blind prophet Tiresias, and spoke there to the shades of Achilles and Agamemnon, nor did he forget to sing of Odysseus's conversation with the shade of Elpenor, ancient king of the Abantes, ancestors of Amphidamas, who had dispatched more ships than any other Achaean to the high-walled citadel of Troy. As was his custom, McLuhan opened the Singer of Tales to its 69th page. Although half of what this is true about Marshall McLuhan, this is how he opened every book, to its 69th page. Uh, and if he liked it, he would then continue reading. And although half of what was printed there was written in a language, Serbo-Croatian, that he could not understand, he evidently liked what he saw because he flipped immediately to the author's foreword and continued on to the preface by Professor Levin, whose monograph on Joyce, which contained a fruitful observation about the influence of film on the Irishman's retelling of the Odyssey and the influence of radio on his retelling of La Cienza Nuova, stood on his shelf, heavily annotated. When he was done, he tucked Professor Lord's book with purposeful satisfaction under the short sleeve of his Hawaiian shirt he wore in the winter months and walked a dozen or so paces from the front door of his red brick Victorian office with its flamboyant turret and the sunburst pattern emanating from the gable dormer down the block that is now named for him to the entrance of neighboring Carl Hall, an austere modernist fortress with an octagonal steeple where the library collection of St. Michael's College, University of Toronto was temporarily being housed. Spread out on mahogany tables of the reading room on the ground floor that McLuhan had commandeered while the students were away during the summer holidays in order to sprint to the finish of the book whose theme he had announced in a July 16, 1952 letter to his pen pal at St. Elizabeth's Hospital for the Criminally Insane as the end of the Gutenberg era where hundreds of index cards containing long quotations from nearly as many authors representing some two decades worth of deliberate and accidental research into the impact of alphabetic and print technology on the bodies and bodies politic of the persons and societies that used them. He lit a cigar. Through the open window of the reading room, the faint notes of a trumpet arrived on the breeze. Someone was listening to the second track of Birth of the Cool. On an empty index card, he copied out a long passage from Professor Levin's preface, and on another he copied out a short passage from the book that followed it. The cards would get shuffled and reshuffled many times that summer as McLuhan searched for an order to the story they would be used to tell, but by the time his secretary sat down to type up the final draft for his editor of the University of Toronto Press, these were the ones that wound up on top. The first line of the prologue to what he now called the Gutenberg Galaxy reads, the present volume is in many ways complementary to the Singer of Tales by Albert B. 
Lord. Like Joyce and Pound, McLuhan was not shy about re recognizing his source material, though in the extremes to which he pushed their citational practices, the book his book most resembles was an encyclopedia, the Byzantine Suda, for example, or closer in time, an unfinished study written largely in German of the 19th century Parisian arcade system whose existence, long the subject of speculation and rumor, would only be confirmed in 1981, the year after McLuhan's death, when 36 sheaves of folded yellowing paper were discovered in the archives of the pornographer slash philosopher, Georges Bataille, in whose capacity as the librarian of the Bibliothèque Nationale, at the Bibliothèque Nationale, they had been entrusted a few months before their author's botched attempt to flee occupied France culminated in his overdose on morphine tablets in a dingy room in a small three-story hotel in a resort town on the coast of Brava. Thus, the Gutenberg Galaxy may have been complementary to the work of Perry and Lord, as we have seen, but it was also, we learn a few pages later, a prolonged meditation on a theme of zoologist Jay Z Young. It was a footnote of explanation to his mentor's book, Empire and Communications. Indeed, nothing more than a gloss on a single text by Harold Innes, one that nevertheless owed a good deal of its reason for being written to H.J. Chator's study of medieval manuscript culture, and one whose method was directly related to that found in physiologist Claude Bernard's introduction to a textbook of experimental medicine, but whose procedure, by contrast, could be explained by a passage from mathematician E.T. Whitaker's attempt to prove the existence of God, and whose explanation and justification could be provided by William Blake's poem, Jerusalem. More than three quarters of the way into the book, a manic and apparently exhausted McLuhan even confesses, at this point, it would be a joy to have a Dick Tocqueville to take over the writing of the Gutenberg Galaxy, for it is his mode of thought that is here followed so far as possible. With only the Byzantine analogy at hand, though we would have certainly appreciated the German Jewish writer's characterization of his passagean work as montage, he likened his own eclectic method or procedure or mode of thought to the construction of a mosaic from the Greek museos, which, as he was surely aware, meant belonging to the muses, of whom the above aforementioned might be said to be nine. For just as quadratic tesserae of gold and porphyry and lapis lazuli could be combined to produce the image of Christ Pantocrator in the main dome of the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, or better, just as pinpricks of paint could be arranged according to color theory to produce the image of a woman with a parasol walking a monkey on a leash through the Ile de la Grande Chatte, or better still, just as electron guns could shoot beams of red, green, and blue light through a cathode ray tube to produce the image of Fred Flintstone on a television screen, so too, McLuhan wagered, could a series of quotations, when framed by his commentary, produce an image of the making of typographic man. A reader, nevertheless, comes away from the Gutenberg galaxy with the distinct impression that it never quite manages to achieve escape velocity, that even in its concluding chapter, it is still trying to define what it is hoping to do, and that she, the reader, is left in the end holding nothing more than an IOU some 300 pages long to be cashed upon the publication of a special study in another volume at some as yet unspecified point in the future. But for all the eccentricities of his choice of medium, McLuhan's message could not be more straightforward. Media technologies are extensions of the sense organs, tools that over time shape the forms of thought and the mental outlook of their users, Change the tools and you change everything about your experience. Change enough people's experience and you will change everything about the society out of which they are composed. The alphabet, perhaps the most consequential tool of all, especially once it was put through the force multiplier of movable type 24 centuries after its arrival in Greece, orients its users visually rather than acoustically, and this in turn distances them from the world, from each other, from themselves. Whereas to a member of an oral culture like Odysseus or Orpheus or Smilagic Mayo for that matter, space is an immersive environment of interwoven forces. To a member of a literate culture, it is a series of discrete objects seen from the outside as though through the rectangular panes of a grid. 
Time, likewise, is not the mystical cosmic fusion of past, present, and future. It is perceived to be in oral cultures. It is the inexorable unidirectional march of the chronological. The corporate interdependence of the tribe slowly gives way to the open society of detribalized individuals in whom the mind's private thoughts are split from the body's public actions and who thus may be said to exhibit, to a greater or lesser degree, a kind of dualistic schizophrenia at the core of their being. McLuhan, as McLuhan would be the first to admit, was by no means the only person to have noticed this. Alongside the singer of tales in the Gutenberg galaxy, the early 60s saw the publication of Eric Havelock's preface to Plato, Claude Levi-Strauss's The Savage Mind, Ernest Mayer's Animal Species and Evolution, and Jack Goody and Ian Watt's paper, The Consequences of Literacy, all texts that were concerned in whole or in part with the profound differences between oral and literate cultures. McLuhan, though we may have well, McLuhan, though, may have well been the first person to notice that he had noticed and to wonder how it was possible, being himself a fully fledged member of a literate culture, that he could have noticed at all, and moreover, why the problem was only now coming into view. His hypothesis, the new electronic media like film, radio, and television were disrupting literate culture just as violently as the alphabet had disrupted the oral cultures in which it had been introduced. We are on the cusp of the electric or post-literate time, he wrote, and thanks to the particular features of these media, above all to the volume and speed of their transmission, the characteristic modes of thought and expressions of their users had come to bear a more than passing resemblance to those of pre-literate cultures. As a result, we were becoming reoralized, he wrote, and that meant re-tribalized. The distinctive mentality of literate culture, which had sometimes been taken as a natural faculty of the human mind, or at least a progressive culmination of a centuries-long intellectual study struggle to free the mind from what it viewed as ignorance and superstition, was now in danger along with all the political and social institutions to which it had given rise, liberal democracy among them, of being revealed as nothing more than a long parenthesis between the chaos and night from which it had emerged and to which it was now returning. So given that, among the many scholars in the fields of media studies and media ecology and media archaeology, of which he is rightly regarded as a common ancestor, his insights into the disruptions of literate culture in the face of electronic media have grown more and not less extensive, and for that matter, intensive, as we have added network digital media to them, it is worth posing ourselves again the question that was posed in the opening of a 1965 profile in the New York Herald Tribune, which appeared in the wake of the publication of Understanding Media, the special study that was promised in the conclusion of the Gutenberg Galaxy, and whose runaway success turned the son of an Edmonton elocutionist from a backwater academic into an international celebrity by a certain white three, oh, oh this is television by a certain white three-piece suit wearing journalist from Richmond, Virginia, whose own bombastic prose style would have been unthinkable without the oral noisy brashness that McLuhan pioneered in the making of his mosaic. What if he is right? And the last one yet. The manids placed the severed head on the mangled instrument and threw both into the Hebrus the white river of Thrace. It stayed afloat until it reached the Aegean, allowing the solely graying tongue to perform a final miracle, the singing of a dirge of such excruciating pathos, a song of self-recrimination and of the murder of the object by the gaze of the subject, that it caused the sea level to rise as each molecule of salt water that hurt it doubled itself in weeping. Anointed with spume and crowned in laurels of kelp, the head made landfall on a stretch of beach near the harbor of Antissa on Lesvos, over 250 miles to the south, inspiring the island's nightingales to untold perfections of sound. The people of Antissa built a grave for him and a shrine, installing the severed head of the poet in the cave of Spilios, where it functioned as an oracle, rivaling Delphi in popularity until it was shut down in Ovid's day, that is, in Christ's day, on the other side of a calendrical schism that had not yet come to pass, and which only an oracle who can weave every possible feature into a pair of paradoxical hexameters would have had the power to perceive. Thus, when she arrived, some seven centuries later, 
traveling from her stepfather's estate in Mytilene, the city on the other side of the island, the oracular head could not have been surprised, even if it was not accustomed to receiving female visitors, let alone ones who were only 12 years old, no matter how headstrong or high-born as this one clearly was, with her violet hair and her gangly limbs and the fearless gaze that did not look away when the twin snakes slithered through its eye sockets and unhooked their jaws to reveal, held fast in their fangs, two round coagulates of black collagen and putrefying vitreous, which regarded her warmly, not a little impressed by her ambition, as she asked with an urgency beyond her years what destiny, destiny had in store for her. Perhaps she reminded the severed head of its ghostly wife, who, also seeing in her end a fall from a perilous height after a betrayal by a trusted ferryman. Or perhaps she reminded it of its immortal mother, who would one day, on the recommendation of an as yet unborn Athenian philosopher, invite this girl to drink wine with her sisters on Helicon. More likely, she reminded it of its former self, an inventor of new forms of poetry, of love. And so, of the many aspects of her future that it could have revealed to her, the great tongue, embalmed in this recognition, chose the one that most closely bound them, questioner and respondent, together. You will win fame as the first self among mortals, it told her, but the future will only know you in fragments. Thank you. above all. Um, how are we doing on... I get it. Oh, yeah, I, I forgot. Yes. Um, we're starting before nine. Okay. So it's up to you what you do next. How tired are you? Be honest. We can, it's totally fine. Do we need to take questions from the audience? If they have things that... Yeah, is that, is that okay? Do no, you no? have a particular... Yeah, we, we've got some, we got some questions yeah. here. We got... Yeah, we'll do a comment. Okay. Okay. Um, Can I introduce you in a glass of water? <laughs> so what we just heard are a series of vignettes that illustrate the arc of a theory that was explained earlier and will eventually completely fill it out. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and um, my question, uh, my first question, I guess, would be to, I would love to hear a little bit about the process of selecting those figures and turning their intellectual work into something that unfolds in a scene. Ah, um, which, so there, it's a little different each scene by scene. So there's the historical figures, so McLuhan and Perry and Lord, and, um, and there's the sort of mythical figures uh, like um, the, the Homer, the poetic figure, uh, and Orpheus, of course, in the sort of quasi-mythical figure, real historical individual, of course, of Sappho, um, about whom we, unfortunately, though, know very little. And so for the procedures of the uh, historical individuals, um, I, I did sort of archival research. So um, while it was not necessarily true that, let's say, Marshall McLuhan walked from, uh, or received this book, for example, from Harry Levin, uh, they did know each other, that journal is a real journal, uh, that office is his real office, that is his real address, and so on and so forth. And so I try to use as much historical detail and to get it as true as humanly possible. For the Homer vignette, um, I, uh, that is a pastiche, I should give credit to, of course, that's a pastiche of the Odyssey put together and retold. Uh, and the translation, of course, I used was uh, Richard Lattimore's but I also used supplementary information by the Homeridae, uh, who are a group of biographers of Homer. Uh, now, of course, their accounts of what who Homer really was were all, almost certainly false. Um, but every sort of fact that I could bring in had some kind of sort of historical or textual or archival basis. Sure, and you were just looking for a moment that grabbed you or that you could sort of... Exactly. So, for example, like uh, McLuhan's shirt or the, uh, the, the picture of Perry in his, in his costume mm -hmm. or um, 
the uh, one biographer of Sappho describes her as having violet hair. Uh, and that this, this sort of thing, these sort of details, take them out, put them in. The heart of this project for me is in its depiction of recent developments in this relationship between media and the development of the subject. Why was it important to begin with Homer? Ah, great question. Um, Oh, so many reasons for that. Uh, one uh, is a personal reason, which is that uh, uh, I think uh, I, I, the, the way my mind works is I have to go all the way back to the, the beginning, um, or what the sort of, I guess, Homer's is arbitrary at beginning as is, is any. But the, the, I suppose that the, the textual justification for it is that McLuhan goes back to Perry and Lord, Perry and Lord go back to the study of Homer. Um, but what, what makes Homer such a besides sort of odd to be. I, I was recently told by uh, an editor that to refer to, refer to ho Homer in your work is to be um, uh, a passé, uh, as if to refer to an 8th century, 8th century BC personage uh, could possibly be anything but passé. Um, so besides the, the great interest of the works of the Iliad and the Odyssey, Homer also represents a very interesting cultural figure in the sense that uh, they uh, provide the only sort of textual evidence, right, of, uh, as opposed to evidence of material culture and uh, of this sort of pre-existing, uh, this time that pre-existed the alphabet when sort of the Bronze Age, of Bronze Age Greece. Uh, and so he represents a figure that's transitioning between two kinds of communications culture um, and furthermore, I would go on to argue, and some people like, for example, Eric Havlock have argued that, in fact, what the Homeric poem really is, is a sort of kind of early communications technology. It's an encyclopedia. It carries the wisdom and knowledge of people who could not have otherwise written it down. It is a means of education, and it was perceived as such, uh, for example, by people who didn't like it very much, like Plato. Um, and so that is another reason that Homer is important. And just in a larger sense, I think the poetry is actually going to, is the linking theme. So the sub-theme of this sort of media studies project is really the importance of poetry as a communications medium and the way poets have always been sort of early adopters of new media technologies. And so as a tribute for first to Homer and then of course to Sappho, um, I, I thought that was important to include uh, their work in it as well. One might imagine that writing about an earlier figure where there's less evidence um, would, would allow more freedom, but in fact, um, they're also more densely linked in a thicket of traditional interpretations. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, as you mentioned, your, your Homer treatment is basically, is it totally collage? Is, is it basically collage? It's basically collage, but it's not totally collage. Okay. And, okay. And so did you, did you feel like you could be actually be freer with the more recent people? Oh, that, that's, that's a good question. Um, it's hard because like, uh, people have often asked me, like, why don't you just write this as uh, an academic work? And on, on the one hand, it's because it's a little you know, drier in, in that format, but also because I could not get away with the kinds of things that I'm saying about Homer. Uh, uh, I've, I've, I had a conversation with a board member of the Einstein Farm who was like, I really, I was a proponent of another interpretation of who Homer was and what his role or their role was in this uh, uh, particular time and place. And I equated myself with uh, a very small fragment of the very broad, even contemporary literature uh, that carries on this debate. And there's really just no way you, and at that moment, the sort of writer brain clicked on, and I picked the I picked the information from those things that struck me as the most, you know, writer interesting uh -huh. to you know from a from a narrative rather than a scholarly point of view, and so yeah, and so in that respect, um, there there come there came to be a point with the with the the older work that there were just too many contrasting interpretations, and in order to put it in to give it no, narrative coherence. I just had to make decisions or invent, as the case may be. Sure. So uh, artistic freedom <laughs> would be a motivation for putting these in vignette form. Yeah, I'd cheating, say. right? I mean, I have my own theory for why a, a vignette form is good for this project. Um, 
one of the strengths of fiction writing is its ability to give insight into other worlds and the minds of people who exist in them. And since your interest lies not exactly in the world, but in the subject uh, that inhabits the world or creates it, it could be that fiction writing is um, one of the best or perhaps the only way to capture that. Is that yeah, uh, true? No, no, absolutely. Um, and I think that the, like, if I were to give a sort of, um, sort of a sort of ideological reason for choosing to do these vignettes, it is precisely on those grounds. Um, and I think that the, the, the role of fiction historically has had a very important role to play in the development of the individual self. And there's, of course, a n number of um, academic literature on this particular subject, self-formation via the novel specifically um, as, as the sort of specific form of sort of high literate self-formation in the 18th century uh, with people like Rousseau, with people um, like Richardson, and then of course culminating in the sort of early period of Jane Austen, that this is an unparalleled way that has not yet even been matched. Not, no film technology matches the ability of fiction to create a plausible image of inner life. Uh, and also to train people and what it means, like when you're reading a book, even when you're a young person and you go through and you're reading, you're also training yourself in privacy and in the privacy of your own individuality. And so the novel has a much more than, you know, it's more, much more than a fun media device. It's also a mode of training of being a specific kind of self that I would like to sort of ideologically defend with the project itself. I think that's a great point to sum up on. Do you think? Uh, okay. Yeah, I agree. Um, It's not a question, it's more of a comment. Uh, when you hit us with your pessimism regarding the communication in the digital age, I couldn't help remembering, I think I read in the news today or yesterday, an uh, um, Iranian Kurdish asylum seeker who arrived luckily after six years of detention in an offshore detention center in Papua New Guinea, he arrived at finally freed and he arrived in New Zealand. And the story of this guy is that he wrote a novel whilst he was in detention and he wrote it with singular text messages. It took him a while, but he did in the end receive a very famous literary prize for it from the state of Victoria in Australia, the very country who had kept him in detention for six years. I wonder what that story tells us about digital communication, the limits, and perhaps you didn't put too much emphasis on it, also the chances of it. Hmm. Uh, well, well, that sounds super cool. I'm like, I mean, not the circumstances in which that was, but that is an obvious exemplar of the almost limitless capacity for, for human creativity in confined circumstances, um, which humans for all their foibles and flaws and evils nevertheless always in every generation manage to display. Uh, you know, and that uh, reminds me of, you know, like Gramsci's writing on cigarette papers or, uh, you know, the Marquis de Sade is like spiriting away his books um, with the means that they had available to them. No, I, I, I don't think that, uh, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what to, to make of the comment, except to say that, of course, it is possible to write a novel via text. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, there are a school of novelists, for example, today, for whom their books consist exclusively of their, um, you know, like chat communications. So like, uh, like Talon is a, is a famous uh, example of this. Uh, and I would be interested to read that particular book to see what particular impact the format, the, the, the production format had on what it was. Like, uh, is this influencing the syntax that is being used? Um, is it uh, influencing the kinds of metaphors that are capable and so on and so forth? And it would, I would guess, having not read it myself, but that the, um, you know, that, that, that would be a particularly difficult uh, 
uh, that, that it would actually be very, very different in its formal production than it would be if you're writing in a computer or if you're writing in a typewriter or if you're writing uh, by hand, of course. Um, so I'd be interested to compare. Thanks, Brian. I found this very stimulating. Um, but I want to remind us that to communicate means to make common. Mm -hmm. And I think if we take that seriously in all its implications, we can get away a little bit from the pessimism and some of the linearity of your account. Um, because communication is not just the way that we talk or the way that we write or the way that we exchange messages. But it's, for example, this room, right? This room, to me, in a sense, is a communication device that's been invested as a kind of convention with a certain way of communicating, right? It would be more difficult to come into this room and just start shouting at each other than it would be to start shouting at each other in a demonstration setting or in a Facebook chat room, right? So, I think that if we go beyond the sort of linear development from oral communication through the kind of subjectivity that's fostered by the written word to what you describe as kind of tribalism fostered by new online communication and enlarge our definition of what communication, I don't want to use the word device because it's very restrictive, right? The kind of communication frameworks that we're moving in um, allow us then I think we can sort of include everything that you're proposing, you know, this, the entire account of the, the changes wrought by the transformation of a certain kind of communicative sphere, but also remain aware of the vast differences between the kind of oral communication, for example, that was happening <coughs> 2,500 years ago in a very different material and kind of conventional framework and the kind of we're seeing now where you know we do spend a lot of time looking at our screens, but we also spend time, you know, riding in trains and sitting in rooms like this and you know being, I don't know, Wall Street investors in rooms that are conventionally formatted to prompt us to value money. But then also literary festivals where the shared convention is that what we value here is the word. Right? So I think communication is more than what maybe you're reducing it to. Uh, yeah, no, that's, uh, that's a great observation in the sense that, of course, uh, there are many types of forms of oral communication. And of course, the context and the cultural sort of framework uh, informing any of those is going to have a bearing on the meaning and I guess what you're referring to is the uh, effective tenor of that particular kind of communication. Um, I'll, I kind of want to say two things about that. One is somewhat divergent from, from your point, which is that one of the things that online communication does is it restricts, or rather it uh, destroys uh, context, right? So in framework. And so uh, I've become very interested in sort of social media theorists' discussions of context collapse, how the production of a particular, uh, you know, phrase or sentence in, that is intended for one particular context because it is publicly available to a number of other contexts um, uh, starts to lose its meaning and take on a sort of suspicious and hostile tone. And people always say, so um, to your point, people say it's like, oh, if we could all just meet face to face, you know, uh, that, that these sort of issues wouldn't happen. But the, the second thing I think of that I think of very often is, is the scene that opens uh, the Iliad, uh, which is a debate uh, between Achilles and Agamemnon. And it's a very interesting scene in terms of what I'm talking about, uh, because it has all the sort of features of the things that, that sort of worry me. Of course, that is a very particular context. Uh, it's different from a uh, Wall Street boardroom, to be sure, or uh, this room, definitely. The thing that 
Does everyone remember the scene? Uh, yeah, does, does everyone remember what's at issue? What? Yeah. So Achilles and Agamemnon are fighting about basically, the, the thing that blows my mind about this particular scene is as follows, right? They're, they're arguing about uh, the spoils of our recent conquest and um, the spoil in the case of Achilles is a female slave called Briseis. Uh, excuse me. Uh, yes, right? It's, uh, yes, exactly. Um, and another female slave called Chryseis. Agamemnon is ordered to give his prize, it's the word that's used, back, and then insists, after a lot of back and forth between him and Achilles, to, that he should take Achilles' prize. And the thing that blows my mind about this is, of course, that this exists within the context of the Trojan War. And the Trojan War, the broader Iliad story, is a story about wife stealing, right? And no one in this debate between Achilles and Agamemnon ever says, you know, I think, um, I think wife stealing is wrong, right? No one ever makes this point, right? No one says, that. it's like, hey, Y'all are, you know, uh, Paris has taken uh, Menelaus' wife. Maybe, uh, since we're fighting a war about that, maybe we should adhere to the principle that wife stealing should not happen. Is there a difference? I mean, I, I agree it shouldn't be the point of difference, but one's a lawful wedded wife and a queen, and the other is. Yeah, and so there are many different accounts of it. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and of course, there's the violation of hospitality, which is engaged. Uh, and so there, there are different sort of flavors, as it were, to the particular violation. Um, and so like Gorgias later, the sophist later, in his uh, defense of Helen was saying, was like, you know, everybody did this all the time. This is a persistent feature of, of, of Greek cultural life. Um, and, and the problem was, with the Trojan War was that everyone got so angry about it, right? So that, that's, that's, the, that's one classical response to that. So, one thing that I noticed is it's not made into an abstract principle. And second is that the way that the conflict between Agamemnon and Achilles is ultimately uh, resolved is that Agamemnon appeals to his authority as the possessor of the staff of Zeus. Um, and they, of course, the entirely antagonistic form of communication in which they engage. And for me, this is sort of like an interestingly totemic thing. Right, we see today very often, here we go, right? We see today, very, like, maybe this is very tenuous. It is very tenuous, but we see today very often new appeals to the authority of the speaker and the person speaking. Um, uh, we see, uh, and we see the failure to make abstract premises or broader sort of ideological arguments. And when you are looking through internet comments threads, it becomes very mentally difficult to do that because you're too worried about the individual that is hidden from you um, or that you mistrust or that you are not in belief of uh, being a sort of reasonably disinterested person who is just another point of view, right? And so these sort of, this sort of antagonism is very different from the kind of conversation or disagreement that you and I might have in a forum like this, right? And, sorry, Misha, you're like, yes, but what does this have to do with writing? Is that the question? No, no, I, I mean, I, I agree with basically everything you're saying and just saying that we can't reduce all kinds of commonality production that we're seeing even today to what's happening online. Oh, yes, I agree. Um, That's all. Um, definitely. I don't know about you, though, however. Uh, my online usage has radically gone up in the last several years, and I feel very, I feel like a different person. And I, I don't even mean to say that in an anecdotal way, uh, but my, I feel notably like my uh, emotions are much more paralyzed, uh, polarized. Um, my sense of time is really fractured. Um, my capacity to recall things is become sort of depleted and so on and so forth. And when I took the time away and was back with a book, um, it, it was as if I was an old self again. And so it's not just that all communication happens to 
is happening online, it's also that people who are communicating online very frequently are now also coming into physical contact with each other and their modality of being is, is being changed. Well, actually, I have loads of questions, but um, the burning one is, could you expand a little on Marshall McLuhan and the number 69? Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. So this is, yeah, this is uh, Marshall McLuhan. So this is uh, to, to Amanda's point, right? When I was trying to think of how to open this and how to make the, the narrative connection between these two people, uh, McLuhan, like, I don't, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this individual as a persona. Um, but uh, he, is, he is a sort of like weird mid-century guru-ish like in the business world, in the like celebrity world, in the tech world. Uh, and he, he thought of himself as, a, as a, a kind of guru and he's kind of wacky in that same kind of way. And he would, you know, and he was known for making, saying like quippy things. And one of the quippy things he's saying is like, oh yes, um, if you know whether a book is any good, want to know whether the book is any good, open it to its 69th page. If you like that, then keep reading. Uh, and I don't know whether, in fact, he did that as a matter of practice. But uh, the one thing that one notices about the Gutenberg Galaxy as a book is that it is uh, a book that is total, almost totally incoherent, just as a, a structural book. And it is if, he had, like for example, uh, like Perry and Lord don't reappear, reappear. Um, things are just thrown up against the wall in a sort of very haphazard and strange kind of way. Uh, and he says things that are almost like unforgivable, like you're like in, like in, in poor taste. And I mean in poor taste and like in poor academic taste. Um, and so I'm thinking it's like, how do, we, how do we get an entree into this story? So I looked at my copy of Singer of Tales, I opened the 69th page, and there like is, uh, you know, the stuff that he cites is on page six. No, 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 no. The, the, no, the stuff that he cites is the, is the first line of the book. Ah. Um, well, on the 69 page is the chart with three songs, and the, what it is is comparative serbo Croatian philology. And I, then, of course, I went and I was like, does Marshall McLuhan speak serbo Croatian? Is, no, it's like Marshall McLuhan's only other language is French. And it clearly, it was bullshit. Like, he didn't do this with his books. But he, this is a famous quip for which he is known. No? 